Shall we stand this evening in the house of God? We'll just greet about two or three people tonight. Make them feel welcome. We need monitor. We need all monitors. The monitors are really soft. Just greet somebody tonight. Make them feel welcome. Let them know that you're glad to see them. Yeah, that means move out of your seat tonight. Make them feel welcome. You're just happy to see you tonight. It's just so good to see you. Amen. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship in one accord. Every praise, every praise. Every praise is to our God. Every praise uh -huh. is to 
Thank you. Yeah. 
give him praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Worthy are you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Just lift those hands tonight all over the auditorium. Just tell them how much you'll love them tonight. Hallelujah. Father God, we just love you, Jesus. You're worthy, Father God. You're worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. We sing, Lord, Lord, you are holy. I find your love, I find your love amazing. You are righteous, Lord, you are righteous. Your majesty surrounds your majesty surrounds us.
keep on seeking, keep on knocking. Praise God. Praise God. Can I have a tad more volume, oh, please? I want to read something while these folks are coming. If you need some other kind of a miracle, join those that are down here. Make a single line so, and that's so folks can get behind you and pray for you. Don't make a double line. But I got a text message from the Devonports. And as you know, we featured them on Sunday with their prison ministry. And I have a long long text message okay doing two services downtown the county jail tomorrow like you to have prayer for us that's tonight at church I'll be leaving on a bus from st. Louis at 5 a.m. to Kansas City so Randy will pick me up at the bus station we're headed for the airport for Baton Rouge Louisiana to do as many as 13 services starting at 6 a.m. on September 15th and and then the first facility is in Mississippi. The second prison is Angola, Louisiana. Both are maximum security. All the services in Mississippi will be in units, uh, segregations, infirmary, lockdowns, and population in pods about 80 to 100 in each unit. Services are about 30 minutes. Uh, I'm looking forward to doing Angola Supermax on the largest prison camp, and it has its own chapel on each camp, but this will be the biggest camp. And the chapel, as many as 500 to 1,000 inmates that are lifers, and the time will, and this time we'll have two hours from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. We'll get to preach, and Randy will lead worship and do some songs. We're able to go through this prison door as a result of the dollar offering that Sheffield gave last Sunday. Yeah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. You can see your money in action. You can see your money in action. Many as would come lay hands on these folks. Come on. Come on, don't be bashful. It doesn't matter if this is your church home or not. If you're a believer, come pray for people. The Bible says these signs will follow them that believe. Make sure everybody has hands laid on them. Okay, we need some more folks over here, some more way over there. Come on. Come on, it's good for you. Build your faith. Build your faith to pray for other people. You don't do the healing, God does it. 
You want to build your faith? Pray for other people. Matter of fact, Paul tells Philemon, as you share your faith, it builds your faith. And so it builds our faith to pray for us. Let's everyone pray like we're the only one praying. Father, we praise and magnify and exalt the mighty name of Jesus Christ tonight. You are truly the Holy One. You are holy, holy, holy. You are righteous. You are almighty. You are so gracious that you love each one of us as if we're the only ones you ever had to love. Father, I pray tonight for those that may be going through a difficult time. I pray that you'll give them that strength that you alone are able to give. Pray you'll draw them near and give that peace of God that passes all understanding. Garrison their hearts and minds with that peace. Father, we pray for all the services going on on both sides of the street. We pray for every service tonight and each person involved when we leave. May we say it not only been good to be in the house of the Lord, but we're closer to God. We're different than we were when we came in the door. Give us understanding of your word tonight. Give us a fresh vision of your glory and your power and your majesty. And Father, we pray right now for your healing power in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Oh, mighty God, come down and touch and heal. We lay hands on our brothers and sisters in the mighty name. Thank Pastor Nicole, musicians, and the praise team tonight. My, my, my. If you didn't feel something, your your feeler's dead. (laughs) Well, God is good all the time. Prophecy still taking place at warp speed. I remember back when my daughter Linda was two. Now, don't tell her I told you she's 53. But when she was two, I brought that message on Ezekiel. The name of the game is oil. And I mentioned Iraq and Iran and Russia, straight out of the book of Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel was about 600 years before the birth of Christ. And I mentioned Iraq and Iran and Russia, and I mentioned oil. And I had a deacon come up and say, you're a nice young preacher, but oil will never be that important. And I, I even said in that sermon that long ago that ultimately Russia would invade Israel for the spoil of the Middle East, which is oil. And again, when I was in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia a couple of years ago for a pastor's conference, that's the second largest Muslim country in the world, on the front page of the Muslim newspaper, it said, if the price of oil drops too low, look for Russia to invade Israel. Because as long when they can control oil prices, it helps their economy, solves every economic problem they have. And the way President Reagan broke up the Iron Curtain was he kept the price of oil low. And that destroyed the Russian economy. And so we're living in Bible prophecy times, folks. It's taking place. How many believe Jesus could come tonight? Amen. How many are ready if he comes tonight? That's the big thing. And I'm going to be preaching a seminar tomorrow on, on Bible prophecy at another church uh, way up north. And it's, a, it's actually a pastor's conference, so I wish you'd remember that in prayer. And then we need uh, 
Oh, well, that's the ushers to pass out our debit envelopes first. If you need a debit envelope to give offering, and if you're like me, I don't carry any cash. I always give by debit envelope. Matter of fact, they have my number in the office. <laughs> and so I just tell them how much to pull out, and they pull it out. You can't out, you can't out give God. Amen. It's not possible. Amen. Not possible. A Christian that doesn't tithe is shooting himself in the foot. Shooting himself in the foot because God says, I dare you. Amen. I dare you to give me the first tenth. It doesn't mean he's going to pay it back next Tuesday, but he will ultimately give back. Ultimately give back. Uh, do we have any first-time visitors here tonight? Anyone here for the first time? We're not going to embarrass you. Just slip your hand. Give these folks a good chef. You're welcome. Praise yeah. God. Uh, we, we need three or four men and someone that has a truck for Friday at 2 o'clock. Uh, Price Chopper is giving us a whole bunch of food for our shop down here. And uh, so, um, okay. Oh, oh, oh. oh, okay. Why'd that write too, Mike? I don't know. I must not have been listening to you. Okay. Oh, okay. He, he, he needed him at 10 o'clock Friday. Is there anyone here that has a truck you can bring at 10 o'clock on Friday? Anyone at all? Because there's a truck right there. Oh, okay, be sure and see Mike or Richard after the service, okay? Okay, and then we need about three or four men. How many other men will come and help move? There's one back there. How many others? Over there, another one? Okay, I can't see back. Okay, good. Anyone else? Anyone else? Maybe you could ask over in the singles tonight, too. Might help over there. So either see Mike or Richard after the service and let them know you'll be there. And if you don't know what the shop is, it used to be the liquor store down here, and we have taken it over. And that's a miracle in the first place. And, uh, and we call it Sheffield House of Provision, and we give away free food. Convoy of Hope has been helping us, and they're, uh, they've had so many disaster reliefs, they're short on food. And now, now Price Choppers come along. We give away harvester food once a month on Saturday, as you know, across the street. They send us a whole tractor trailer full, and we come early and bag that up and give it away. And so... Uh, let me encourage you to be involved in some of these ministries. But the shop is a real ministry. Folks are in need in this day. And so we, as a matter of fact, across the street, sometimes people line up in the middle of the night, you know, across the street on Friday night to get groceries on Saturday. And so we live in difficult times. I hate to say this, but if the Lord tarries, cheer up, it's going to get worse. But he's coming. He's coming. Such an hour as you think not, he says. You don't know when, but he's coming. Okay. So I'll be sure and check with them. We have a couple more announcements. Uh, next water baptismal service is Sunday, September 22nd, immediately following the 11 o'clock service. If you need to be baptized, call Pat at the church office and register and for more information. Now, again, if you're not saved, it doesn't do any good to get baptized. But in the Bible, children are not baptized. People are baptized after they receive Jesus Christ. And that's an act of dedication, an act of dedication to the Lord. We dedicate children. And that's what Jesus was. He was dedicated, brought to the house of God and dedicated when he was a baby by his parents. And so we practice dedication. We don't baptize infants because they're, uh, they're already in the kingdom of God. Jesus said, stop forbidding the little children to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of God. Jesus indicated they're part of the kingdom till they reach that age where they make a moral decision. And it says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. But Jesus himself said, little children are part of the kingdom. And uh, how many know Jesus knows what he's talking about? <laughs> okay? If he doesn't, we're in trouble. <laughs> and so he knows what he's talking about, so we need to pay attention to what he says, not what some theologians say. All right, it's time to give to God. Praise the name of the Lord. And uh, if you didn't get one of the handouts, it's the same one we've had the last couple of weeks on John's Gospel. How many did your homework? How many did not do your homework? Well, we don't want any Ananias and Sapphira. How many didn't do your homework? <laughs> All right. You know, I kind of had a miracle. Uh, as you know, I travel all over the world. I do a master's level course for pastors in eight days sometimes and two weeks sometimes. And I'm scheduled to go to Samoa. And that's what I've been taking special offerings on Wednesday night for. And I called to see how much it was going to cost to get to Samoa. Now, I can't fly coach for that many hours because of my back and my artificial knees and my neck. So I have to fly business class. I called United. How much is airfare? They said $11,000. I almost fainted, but let me finish the story now. 
Uh, when I went to Singapore a couple months ago, I used 320,000 of my miles, so that there wasn't any charge for that trip at all. And I still have 600,000 miles in my account, but every time you call, you're supposed to be able to fly anywhere in the world for 140,000 miles. And actually had over a million miles. And so when, I uh, when you call, they say, well, we haven't had any seats released yet, but if you want to give us 320,000, we'll give you a ticket. And they never release seats, and I can't wait till the last minute because I got all these pastors from all over the world waiting on me to get there and teach. And so I was praying. I said, now, Lord, let, help me to get a seat for 140,000 miles and then go the rest of the way. You just have to get to Hawaii or New Zealand. And so I got a Christian lady on the phone when I called. And I told her what I was doing, and she got me a seat from Kansas City to Honolulu and back for 140,000 miles. But I still had to get to Samoa. And I got on the phone with Hawaii Airline, and I said, I need to get to Samoa. I said, I need to get to Apia. They said, well, we go to Pago Pago. I said, that's American Samoa. I'm not talking about American Samoa. I'm talking about Samoa. Well, I got so frustrated, I finally gave up. Couldn't make the lady understand. So then I looked at the wholesale places on the internet. I know they're supposed to be so cheap. And they said I can get from Honolulu to Samoa for only $3,000. Now, that's a six-hour flight. Okay, it's not short. And I can get there for $3,000. And that was with Fiji Airline. Well, I thought I'm going to call Fiji Airline, and I got the same ticket for $2,000. That's the way God does things, folks. That's the way God does things. So when I was getting cold, cold, I was all set to cancel the course. And God said, don't you cancel. As a matter of fact, when Pastor George was preaching Sunday, God said, are you listening? Don't cancel the course. We'll make a way. And so we appreciate you helping on Wednesday nights, too, if you do. Uh, on the way out, if you'd like to help from my mission trips, there's usually a basket back there, and there's some envelopes you can put down for Dr. Westlake's mission trips. And again, I do a master's level course for pastors. And I, I, well, actually, when I went to Singapore, I did it in eight days, 45 hours of teaching in eight days. But in Samoa, they tell me it's too hot in the afternoon because it's south of the equator. It'll be winter in the, uh, it'll be summer in November. And they say the college isn't air conditioned. So they said it's too hot to have classes late in the day. I said, well, what can I do the rest of the day? They said, wait and swim. Well, I'm part fish. That was like saying sick him to a bulldog. <laughs> but I'll probably end up teaching a prophecy seminar on churches at night. I like to be busy when I travel. Uh, last time I was traveling, when I went to Monterey, Mexico, I did a prophecy seminar, I did a marriage seminar, and then I preached five times on Sunday, and then I taught uh, every morning and every night. And that's what I like to do. I like to be busy. It's a good thing I'm young. <laughs> Father, we're thankful again tonight we have the opportunity of giving back to you a portion of that that's already yours. You make us managers, and we know from, we know from Luke 16 that everything belongs to you, and there's coming an accounting day for how we've managed. We know that you want to bless your people. And your word tells us clearly that when we obey you in giving, then you promise to open the windows of heaven and rebuke the devourer. So I pray as we offer you these gifts on our hearts of love, give back to your people abundantly. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. 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 Now we are in John's Gospel, How to Study the Bible, Part 3. And when we get done with this, we're going to go into the book of Ephesians verse by verse. But we're going to look at the whole book first, do observations and everything else. Now, we made observations last week on the first three of the signs. Okay, the water to wine, we talked about that. We talked about the healing of the nobleman's son in John chapter 4. And we talked about the lame man at the pool of Bethesda. And you notice Pastor George preached on that Sunday. Talked, that's the way God moves. Talked about the lame man at the pool of Bethesda. And, and we didn't draw all the spiritual truth out of that we can. And so that's in John's Gospel, chapter 5. John's Gospel, chapter 5. But I want to show you something else to, about observation in a few minutes. Now, i uh, read this again. John, chapter 5, verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is a Jerusalem by the sheep market, a pool which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. And these are all different levels. They've uncovered the pool of Bethesda. They're all different levels. And these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of, of, of blind, of, of lame, of withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season to the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever first stepped in after troubling the water is made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity, and the Greek word is osteneia. He was sick. 38 years. 
And when Jesus saw him lying, who he had been now a long time in that case, he said, do you want to be made whole? And the impotent man answered him, sir, I have no man when the water's troubled to put me into the pool. While I'm coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, took up his bed and walked. The same day was the Sabbath. And the Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, it's the Sabbath day, it's not lawful for you to carry your bed. He answered him that made me whole, the same said unto me, take up your bed and walk. They asked him, what man is it that said unto you, take up your bed and walk? And he didn't know who it was, for Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being there. Afterward, Jesus finds him in the temple, said unto him, behold, you're made whole. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus that made him whole. Therefore, the Jews persecuted Jesus, sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. That's what legalism does. Legalism points the finger. If you're not, don't look like me, act like me, talk like me, dress like me, and believe like me, you're not a Christian. Y'all still here? That's legalism. And there's a lot of legalistic Christians like that. They love to judge other people. That's why I like Randy's song. Okay, where's the love that he sang last Sunday morning? Okay, they took a look at him. No wonder they took a look at him. Said, how can you be a Christian? And, uh, but that's what, that's what people do. But it's God's grace. Man looks at the outward appearance. What does God look at? The heart. That's the big issue. Yes, sir, loud. Uh, have a mic. Yeah, Jesus, they sin the Lord. Is that concern that sin causes Not necessarily. Not necessarily. And uh, you recall another one of the miracles the apostles asked, Lord, who did sin? This man or his parents said he was born blind. And what did Jesus say? Neither. That's not the issue. Because we live in a world that's under a curse. Okay, the world's been under a curse since the Garden of Eden. And we inherit certain things. Okay, how many of you have trouble seeing? How many, how many wear glasses beside me? Okay, you inherited that. You inherited that. I inherited funny hair from my mother. All right? We inherit all kinds of things. And so, uh, because the whole thing is under a curse. So the issue is not how did a person get there. Our, our purpose is not to say, how did this person end up a drug pusher? How did this person end up this? How did this person end up that? How did this person get to this? That's not the issue. The issue is God wants to set them free by his amazing grace, no matter how they got there or what the cause is. So we don't, that's why we announced for, uh, for years on television, we're not a social club, we're a hospital for hurting people. And we don't care about your background or where you're from or how you got there. We want you to know Jesus Christ can set you free by his power tonight and can change and transform your life. And that's the message of the Bible. That's what Jesus he came to seek and to save that which was lost. And George preached on that Sunday. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And that's our commission. Now, I handed out a list of what we're supposed to ask when we look at this. Uh, it's on the sheet from last week. It's on, not on this week. All right. And, and, and it's on the sheets from last, uh, uh, and from a couple weeks ago. Now we've made observations, and we also uh, we also noticed some spiritual truth here. Okay. Now what's uh, what are the main spiritual truths, Alan? I don't want you to answer this. What are the main spiritual truths that we see in this story? Anybody? Loud. I'm running. Come on. Okay. We're trying to apply it now. We've observed what happened. Okay. What? Well, what do we learn for about our life from this passage? Jesus can heal. Jesus can heal. What else? Only heal if you don't want to be. Want to be. Is my mic wet? Yeah. Yeah. My mic just died. Yeah. Okay. I'll talk loud. We have a building app. Oh, okay. I'll use it. Well, no, because I need my hand. Talk <laughs> <laughs> about my hand. <laughs> Hold my bag. She said, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Battery's went dead. <coughs> but you want to be made whole. That's the whole issue here. You want to be made whole. Right. But to me, the strongest issue is this. Jesus told the man to do the one thing he couldn't do. That's what Pastor George preached on Sunday. Right. I mentioned last week, if I'd have been there and he said, get up and walk, I'd have said, man, you're cruel. That's something this guy can't do. He can't get up and walk. Now, the same God that said, get up and do the thing you can't do, said, go and sin no more. All right. Now, would God tell us to do it if he didn't give us the power to do it? Amen. No. But how many fail God? 
Church PA systems are demon possessed. So, that's true. But, but, but I was happy when I was down at Disney one year and their PA system squealed too. So. But he said, Do you want this? And then get up and do the thing you can't do. What is it God's telling you to do that you say, I can't? That's what he wants you to do. That's what he wants you to do. We can't save anybody, we can't heal anybody, we can't do any of that. But we obey him and he does all the work. Okay? But we have to obey. If I'm not going to obey, it's not going to happen. And so we have to get out of the boat. We have to do what God tells us to do. Now I want to ask another question. I want you to observe something. Go to John chapter 3 and we'll come back to the... Well, well, well let's do this one first. I got the list here. What does this sign show me about God? What does this sign show me about God? Okay, the one we just looked at. Anybody? He's a miracle, miracle worker. Okay, he's a miracle worker. He heals. Okay, what, okay, now what does it show me about myself? You have to put up the effort. Absolutely. You have to put up the effort. Well, okay. Uh, what does this mean in my relationship with God? That he works all the time. That he works all the time and you have to... Trust and obey. 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 Yeah, how many like to have your own way? <laughs> All right. Well, what does it tell me about my relationship to other Christians? Okay, let's do this one. How, uh, how does it affect my relationship to non-Christians? What did the man do? He got up and walked, but what else? Who made you whole? When he found out it was Jesus, he told them, your responsibility is to let the world know about the miracle working God. Amen. And again, the book of Philemon, it's almost untranslatable from the Greek. He actually says, as you share your faith with others, it builds your faith. As you tell them what God's done for you, it builds your own faith in Jesus Christ. So we are called to be witnesses, okay? A witness, all right? Uh, and non-Christians, uh, there isn't any other relationship with Christians here in this particular passage. But then on the other side of the page, I've got a couple other things. Well, what does this show me about my responsibility to be involved in the kingdom of God? Again, telling other people about it. Okay, Elizabeth, what were you going to say here? Um, also, the man is set outside of the religious barriers, like it being the Sabbath and the Jews saying that. Okay, he had to get outside the religious barriers. Custom... Uh, how many of you have seen the movie or the, or you saw the Broadway play Fiddler on the Roof? Anybody see Fiddler on the Roof? Very first song, tradition, tradition, and tradition can be a killer. Absolutely be a killer. How many of you were taught like I was? Oh, go ahead. And go ahead. I just want to share an incident with you, and I need your thoughts, please. Okay. Uh, last week at college, I got into a spiritual debate with the teacher, which, you know, over some beliefs, 
and the beliefs that I learned at this church, and I got attacked by that professor, which was very unprofessional, and the entire class, and I am still trying to recover from this. Your thoughts on that, please? Well, you're going to be attacked. You're going to be attacked. People don't like to have their belief challenged. They don't like to have their belief challenged. I went to a liberal seminary. I won't tell you where it was, uh, but, but uh, I had to get a second master's before I could start working on my doctorate. There are a lot of doctorates around, uh, you know, in my doctorate, I have a one-year master's, a three-year master's, and a four-year doctorate on top of my bachelor's. But uh, I had to have a, I actually had to, I actually had to have a three-year master's before I could start the doctoral program. And the professor that was teaching the Old Testament didn't believe it. He just didn't believe it. He taught a bunch of fairy tales, and they used a textbook that was made by Reformed Jews, and Reformed Jews is the Sadducee of the Bible. They don't believe a whole lot of anything. The Orthodox, uh, the Orthodox Jew is a Pharisee. The conservative Jew believes the Bible, but they don't practice all the legalisms. And so I was the only one in the class that was like that. And we got to the place, and it was actually team taught by a Reformed Jewish rabbi. And here were all these young people. I was already pastoring this church when that happened. And there were all these young people that, that were there buying all this stuff. And I, I went, argued with a professor the whole semester. I wasn't about to let these guys believe that. But uh, he raised one issue, and he said, God accepts human sacrifice. And I challenged him. I said, the only human sacrifice he accepts is his son. And he said, Joe, no, he accepted Jephthah's daughter, and, he, and he, she, he is held up as a hero of faith. I said, now, you know Hebrew better than I do. And secondly, she bewailed her virginity, the fact that she was never married. She did not bewail her death. And even though the King James says the ladies lamented her once a year, it says they went out and spoke with her once a year. So she was actually put in a convent situation. Uh, he did not kill his daughter. He never saw her again. She was in a convent type situation. And the professor said, George is crazy, isn't he? He turned to the Jewish rabbi and said, he's crazy, isn't he? And the rabbi said, no, he's right. Yes. <laughs> so, no, Alan? I think my mic's on now. Okay. To piggyback on that. Okay. okay. Wow. To piggyback on that. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath here in this parable. Now, the Jews were the people of the Sabbath. The one commandment that was not translated to the New Testament was keep the, keep Sabbath, the Sabbath day holy. Day, right. So Jesus is saying, uh, not only a relationship with the Jewish people, I'm Lord of all the people. Amen. 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 Okay, now, so he actually, see all these things, we have to look and answer all these questions. What does he show me here that might hinder my spiritual life? Can you see anything here that might hinder your spiritual life? Being legalistic like the Pharisees. You got to do it my way. You got to comb your hair like I comb my hair. You got to dress like I dress. You got to have your hair the length of my hair. Okay? And uh, legalism's like that. That's what Paul argues in Romans 14 and 15. If God tells you you can't do something, many of you know I was a professional magician when I was a teenager, and God said that I had to put it aside. That doesn't mean, uh, that does not mean that someone that uses magic for illusion, uh, magic for, for illusion, I mean someone that uses illusion to present the gospel is wrong. It's just that I couldn't do it anymore. And then years later, God said, now you can do it. Why? Because I gave it to him, and he gave it back to me about 20 years after that. And we used to have kids' crusades across the street, and I did 45 minutes every night. I flew Pastor George in the air, sawed him in half, and did all kinds of things across the street. He survived it all. You saw him someday. <laughs> it, uh, but, uh, but, I, but I couldn't go around and say, you can't do that now, because I can't do it. And that's the kind of thing Paul deals about in Romans 14 and 15. Something that God shows you is wrong for you does not necessarily mean it's wrong for him. Now, what the Bible calls sin, what is it? Sin. But a lot of things are amoral. It's what you do with them. They're not good. They're not bad. It's what you do with them. And so we have to be careful we don't strain at gnats and swallow camels and get legalistic toward other people and expect them to be just like us. There'd be nothing more depressing than, 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 than preaching to a whole congregation of George Westlakes. That would be depressing. Everyone looked like me, act like me, talk like me. Boy, what a lousy world that would be. God loves variety. But I want us to do some observing on John chapter 3. I wasn't planning on this, and I was sitting at the table this afternoon, and God said, why don't you see what they do with John chapter 3? 
Now we all know the passage very well, starting with verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. That means he was a member of the Sanhedrin, the ruling body. Saying came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, by the way, Rabbi means my teacher. We know that you're a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that you are doing that, unless God's with him. Jesus answered said, Truly, truly, I say unto you, except the man be born again. Now the Greek text says from above. But born again is the accurate translation because as you read it, that's what he's talking about, a new birth. He cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time when his mother's womb be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Now, what does it mean to be born of water and the Spirit? And just to give you an illustration of what some people do, they jump right away to the interpretation instead of what it says. So we have to see what does it actually say here? What's actually said? What do we actually know just from reading this that we all agree it says? Okay, anybody, not Alan. <laughs> Pardon? He doesn't use the word baptize here? No, he doesn't use the word baptize. He just says water. Born of water. Okay, what else? Pardon? No, he doesn't say living water. It, it, okay, it's only what it says. Living water is chapter 7. Anybody, what does it act? See, this is what we get. We have to learn what it says before we go to anywhere else. And we don't like to do that. We like to jump right away to conclusion, application. You, you, you'd be surprised. I wouldn't be because I've told you enough. When I teach pastors and I teach this, this is what I'm teaching when I go to Samoa. I'm actually teaching hermeneutics, how to interpret the Bible. Now, it's a lot more complicated than what we're doing here. But the thing is, they want to get right away, what does it mean? No, 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 you've got to see what it says. We've got to see what it says first. What does it actually say here? Okay. Okay. That he was sent by God. Okay. Okay. Nicodemus believed Jesus was sent by God. Yes, ma'am. Man has to be born again. What else is here? Um, I, I, I think that. Well, well, talk loud. Water, My, I think that he meant as because he referred to it in other in other passages with other people. Water as in living water, like. I'm well, living water is chapter 7. We're not in chapter 7. We're right here. We're right here. We're not looking at other passages. We're looking just what the text says. Only what it says. Now talk loud. Talk loud. My ears are 81 is years old. Is it referring old. to the natural birth, a spirit, you know. Natural water, birth and a spiritual water. birth. Okay, what else? Okay, anybody else? I said two births. Okay, you have to have two births. Yeah. But... Yeah. Only the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. Only the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. Okay, that's what it says here. Okay, now, here's an interpretation I read in a book years ago by someone who's considered a world-renowned preacher. He said, well, when it says you have to be born of water and the Spirit, water must represent baptism, and you had to repent before you were baptized. Therefore, water represents repentance. Is there anything here that says that? No! no. He was reading into it. And a lot of you have expressed exactly what's written here. The water birth is the natural birth. Just read what it says. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Verse 4, Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb? Now the ancients knew a baby's born from a bag of water is just like we do. And that was Nicodemus' question. Can I get back in my mother's womb and be born? And Jesus said, no, you have to be born of water and the Spirit. Now, he explains it in the next verse. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. Nicodemus, you can get back in your mama's womb a hundred times and you're still flesh. But that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So as a lot of people have always said you have to have a natural birth and a spiritual birth. There isn't anything else implied here. So we have to see what it says, not jump to other passages, not try to explain it, not try to interpret it, just see what it says.
And it's amazing when you see what the book says, how it opens things up. But we don't like to do that. Pastors don't like to do it. I know because I'm one. (laughs) And so we have to look and see what it says. So he's just talking about the natural birth. Nicodemus, you can come back to your mama's womb a hundred times. That which is born of the flesh is still flesh. But you have to be born of the spirit too. That's the new birth. And uh, that's why Paul tells the Galatians, in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision avails anything nor uncircumcision. Not a religious ritual, but a new creation. If any man be in Christ, he is a what? New creation. Old things are passed away. And one of those teachings that's still on television is, well, you're half the old man, half the new man. No, the Bible defines your old man as your former manner of living. You're not some kind of a spiritual schizophrenic when you're born again, all right? If any man be in Christ, he's a half new creation. New old things are passed away and all things have become new, all right? Born of flesh is flesh, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And that's all he's saying. So the Bible uses parallelism, and Jesus, uh, that was a common teaching of the Psalms and other Bible poetry. You say one thing, then you explain it in the next verse. And that's what Jesus did here. Explain what he meant. That was the born of the flesh is flesh, that was the born of the spirit is spirit. So we just have to read what it says. So be occupied with reading what it says first, then go back and say, what does it mean? How do I apply it? What do I do with it? And we don't like to do that. So we have to learn. We have to learn. Okay, let's look at another sign here, the feeding of the 5,000. John chapter 6. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is also the Sea of Tiberias. A great multitude, and by the way, it's an inland lake. The Sea of Galilee is an inland lake. And they do have some pretty bad storms there. Because right not far away is Mount Hermon. The elevation is 9,000 feet. And the Sea of Galilee is the lowest pace. Uh, well, actually, the Rift Valley that it's in is the lowest valley on Earth. And the Dead Sea is the lowest place on Earth. What is it, 1,200 feet below sea yes. level or something yes. like that? And so that air can invert. And our guides tell us instantly you can have 10 and 12 foot waves on that little inland lake. And so it's a stormy place. Great multitude followed him. They were seeing the miracles which he was doing on those who were diseased. He went up into a mountain and sat with his disciples to pass over. A feast of the Jews was near. Jesus lifted up his eyes, saw a great company, and said to Philip, where can we give by bread that these can eat? For he said to test him, knowing what he would do. And God will test your faith. Okay, how many of you exercise? Jesus. Okay, okay if you don't use your muscles, what happens? They atrophy. They atrophy. That's the same way with faith. If God just did everything for us, we'd never have to have faith. I, you notice he wasn't in the fiery furnace till Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego got in. <laughs> see, we want to see him in the fiery furnace as long as of them and not us in it. We want to see God part the Red Sea as long as Pharaoh's not chasing us. All right. But it builds your faith. See, you, you, you face a difficult time and suddenly God opens the door. And just a little thing, but I was frustrated. I thought I'm going to have to use another 320,000 miles. That may be a little thing to some of you, but I, but I think of all the trips I can make. I only use that for mission trips. I never use it personally. And I thought, God, I don't want to have to use another 320,000 miles. So I, I think God gave me a miracle. But he let me get frustrated first. <laughs> Come on, how many get frustrated? Come on. <laughs> And so it's, uh, you know, that's the way God works. We have has to build our faith, learn to trust him, learn to depend on him, learn to see what God can do. I know back in 91 when they took my wife's stomach out, she had cancer of the stomach, and uh, we almost lost her three times in eight days. And the last time we used to do our TV program on Sunday nights, Living Answers for Today, they actually called it Sunday Night Live then. It was a live question and answer Bible program. And my daughter Debbie called me about midnight and said, Dad, she's bleeding even through her nose, and the nurses say it's normal. And by the time I got to the hospital, she had zero blood by the time I got to the doctor there. Not a drop of blood in her body. And the kids and I just got in the room, and all we could pray was, Lord, she belongs to you, but we'd like to hang on to her. Well, that was 91. 
and she's still around. So thank God for his grace. But you have to go through the waters. How are you going to know what God can do if you never get in the fiery furnace? That's why Peter said, stop thinking it's strange concerning the fiery trial that's trying you. Some strange thing happened to you? He says, rejoice. You're a share of his suffering. You'll be a partaker of his glory. So if you're going through something, he'll go with you. He'll go with you. All right. So he said, 200 denarius. That's enough wages for one man for 200 days. Are not sufficient to feed them all. That everyone can take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said, Well, there's a lad here who's had five barley loaves and two small fish, and that'd be like a piece of pita bread. All right? And Jesus said, Make the men sit down. There's much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. And the Greek word here is aner. That's men as opposed to women and children. The other gospels say 5,000 men beside women and children. The usual word for mixed multitude is the word we get our word anthropology from, but that's not the word here. It means men as distinct from women for 5,000. So by sides of families, there may have been 30 or 40,000 people there. Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, the disciples of them that were set down, likewise of the fishes, as much as they would, when they were filled, he said, gather up the fragments that remains that nothing be left. They gathered them together and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves that remained over above those which had eaten. Now those men, when they had seen the miracles that Jesus said, this is the truth of prophets that should come into the world. When Jesus therefore perceived they would come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to a mountain himself alone. Now when evening was come, his disciples went down to the sea. And the other gospels say he commanded them to go across the sea. They entered into a ship, went over the sea toward Capernaum. But now dark, and Jesus wasn't come to them. The sea rose by reason of a great wind that blew. When they rode about five and twenty or thirty furlongs, about a third of the way across, they see Jesus walking on the sea, drawing near to them, and they were afraid. And the, you know, the King James says, the other Gospels, they thought they saw a spirit. The word should be translated ghost there. <laughs> they thought they saw a ghost. And he said unto them, literally, I am Stop being afraid. Amen. That's another one of the I am's. It's not in here. But he said, I am. Stop being afraid. Yep. Go, because of he is. He didn't say I am he. He just said I am. Amen. Yeah. I am. Yeah. Stop being afraid. And they willingly received him into the ship. Immediately the ship was at the land where they were going. Now, what do we see just observing here? Well, what happened? Come on. What, 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 what does the text say? What does it say? He fed the people. He fed the people. What else does it say? Come on. Okay, so he went to the other side without being in the ship. But well, way back up earlier, what does it say? He knew they'd want to take him by force and make him see. They came by force after he fed. But let's go back earlier in the story. What happens at the first part of the story? He said, give them to eat. Okay, where are we going to get bread to feed these people? He asked them a question. Just look at the text. Don't read anything into it. Just see what it says. We don't like to do that, do we? Even after all the last couple of weeks. Yes, ma'am. Loud. Okay, I, I couldn't hear that. What? Okay. Okay, he himself knew what he would do. Philip was looking at the monetary th side of it. He said, okay, wait. All right, we have X amount of money. We have X amount of people. So how are we going to buy enough bread? To right. So he was really questioning, how, how's this going to happen? Yeah, yeah, how's this going to happen? Have you ever asked God how? Because we're, we're, we're in a place that I asked God a long time ago, how's this going to happen? Because all my pastor friends said, get that church out of the city. It can't happen there. Pastor. Yeah. Jesus trusted that God would provide for them. Okay. Um, 
and he said that, you know, even though he had already performed those miracles, he knew they were going to ask how. So he's already saying that, you know, even though he's performed miracles, they're still wondering how they're going to do this. So he's already proven himself, but there's still some doubt, maybe. Okay, but he had never done anything to this magnitude yet. Um, I don't know if the disciple was being suspicious, but one of them had said, there's a lad here who has... Five loaves and two fishes. Yeah, what good's that? Yeah, right. Well, we need a million dollars. Well, somebody here's got two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, now what do you... Okay, now let's apply it. Okay. Okay. Now he challenged their faith. He knew, what he, it says he knew what he was going to do all the time. Yeah, yeah, where are we going to buy bread? He did this to test them. But he knew what he was going to do. I'm glad he knows ahead of time. Amen. Knows ahead of time. I'm the same way. God keeps on intervening time and time again. And still I don't believe when the next thing comes up. Right. <laughs> Yeah, we still struggle sometimes, don't we? They've seen a lot of things. So, okay, he fed 5,000 men beside women and children. Uh, they took up 12 baskets full of untouched food. Can't imagine that little boy going home with the men carrying baskets of food. What happened? I gave my lunch to a man named Jesus. <laughs> okay, he went into a ship. There was a great wind blew, a storm came, and Jesus walked on water. Now, you didn't think you wouldn't have been, if they didn't know Jesus could walk on water? What would you do if you're out in the middle of a storm and you see this thing walking to you in the middle of the night? No wonder what's the matter with them. Don't we doubt the same way frequently? God does one miracle and another miracle, and another one comes up, whoops, how's God going to do this? And they willingly received him into the ship. Then the ship was where it was going. Willingly received him into their midst. So when God tells us to do something, we accept his guidance, he's going to get us there. Helen? Wonderful thing is he doesn't say here, wait until you say, see what I'm going to do or what's wrong with your faith here. But he says, I am, ego a me, stop fearing. Yeah. And then... Uh, you go on and read the rest of the chapter. You can read it at your convenience. They said, well, this isn't such a big miracle. Moses fed, fed people for 40 years in the desert. And they said, show us a sign and we'll believe. The only sign they would accept was marching on Jerusalem and driving the Romans out. They wouldn't accept any other sign. That's why they came to make him king. Boy, he's got all this power. Let's march on Jerusalem. Let's drive the Romans out. That's the only miracle they would have accepted. Now, one of the questions I asked was, uh, on the next page. Do any of the I am's explain the spiritual truth connected with the sign? And this is one of those. Because he uses this miracle to explain the spiritual truth that he's the bread of life in the rest of the chapter. The bread of life. There's only two of the signs, and I'll let you, I'll let you read the Gospel of John for next week and find out which is the other one. There's only two of them that he uses the I am's to explain the miracle. Okay, or to show the purpose of the miracle, this is one. I notice down to verse 35. And he goes on to point out God gave him the bread from heaven, not Moses. He says in verse 35, I'm the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger. He that believes in me shall never thirst. Now go over to verse 48. And I want to explain this. One of my favorite passages, and I've preached on it a lot. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate men in the desert. They're dead. This is the bread that comes down from heaven. A man can eat thereof and not die. I'm the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat this bread, he shall live forever. The bread that I will give is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among them, saved, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Now, he's not talking about the communion service. He says later on, these words are spirit and life. I'm not talking about fleshy things. Now, he changes the word. Whosoever is munching on my flesh. How many ever get the munchies? Jesus. 
He changes the word from eating to munching. Uh, for those of you that are Greek scholars, from estheo to trogon. All right? Whosoever is munching on my flesh and drinking my blood, continuous action has eternal life, and I'll raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat and dread, my blood is drink and deep. He that is munching on my flesh and drinking my blood remains in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that is munching on me shall live by me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat man and are dead, but he that is munching on this bread shall live forever. Now, what's the difference between eating and munching? When you eat, you sit down at a meal, but you can munch driving your car. You can munch doing the dishes. You can munch at work. You can munch anything. What's he teaching us? To practice the presence of God. To feast on him 24 hours a day. I've taken my stand at the door and I'm knocking. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in and feast with him. And he will feast with me. It's a two-way feast when we know Jesus Christ. Munching on him and him munching on us. <laughs> so he wants that intimate relationship with every person that's here. He wants that intimate relationship. They turn to the person next to you and say, God wants an intimate relationship with you. <laughs> and when we understand that each of us are as important to God as anybody else. Okay. So, he walks on the water. Walks on water. You can't walk on water. Uh, one of these liberal preachers said, well, he's walking on the shoreline. You mean those fishermen didn't know the difference between the shoreline and water? John was a fisherman, don't forget that. Okay. Why don't you use the mic here? When he says in chapter 35 that you will never thirst, was that a representation of walking on the water? Is no, that... no, no, no. <laughs> I mean, we're feasting on him, eating and drinking. Yeah, but he had the miracle of walking on water first, and then he says that. You know, feeding of the 5,000, you never go home. No, the first miracle was the feeding of the 5,000. Yeah, but when he then he came on, walking yeah, on the water. Yeah, when he walks on water, does, yeah. does that represent never thirsting, though? No, no, just walking on the water. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. He can't make it mean something it doesn't mean. Yeah. A lot of times people do with parables, they make it mean 55 different things. And it only means one. It only means yeah. one. Yeah. Bible means what it means. So come back there. And Reverend... Uh -huh. That was two miracles he done with the fish and the bread. And the second was walking on water. Right. The third was immediately the ship was at land. Pardon? Would that be the mir a third mir yeah. miracle? Oh, yeah, that was one of the miracles walking on the water was the next sign. Yeah. But the boat was immediately at, <laughs> at the shore. Oh, yeah. It's all part of the same sign. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the boat was immediately at the shore. God will get you where you're going. Amen. Okay. Oh, yeah, the other two-thirds of the water. Two -thirds of, it's 11 miles across the Sea of Galilee. And America can't hear you. Don't you think it did sound pretty crazy to them back then? Well, if I still can't hear can we crank that other mic up a bit? Don't you think it did sound crazy to them? Well, yeah. I mean, eat my flesh. Yeah. You think he's a nut job. Well, that's what they said. Many of his disciples went away. They said, who, who can take this saying? It's a coarse saying. And, and then, read, many of his disciples went back. And he, the other gospel tells us, he turned to the 12 and said, you going to go away? They said, who shall we go to? You have the words of eternal life. So you got to compare the gospel stories. Yeah. But then, yeah, they thought he was loony. Then, you know, one time his brothers thought he was loony. You read it. He said, let's go take our brother home. He is beside himself. In other words, in plain 20th century English, our brother's gone over the edge. He thinks he's the son of God. What would you say if suddenly your brother you'd known your whole life said, I am the king of Israel. Oh, come on. In John chapter 7, you know what they said very soon? Well, let's read it. John chapter 7. Oh, I'm looking at 8. That's why I can't find it. <laughs> right, in verse 7, after these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk. That means around Jerusalem, because the Jews were seeking to kill him. It wasn't his time yet. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brother therefore said unto him, Depart and go to Judea, 
that the disciples might see the works that you're doing. For there's no man that does anything in secret, and he himself seeks to be known. If you do these things, show yourself to the world, for neither did his brothers believe in him. But go show yourself off if you're who you claim to be. His brothers didn't believe in him any more than you believe in your brother. Now, who became the head of the church after the resurrection? Alan, don't you answer this. James, the brother of Jesus. James, the brother of Jesus, became the head of the church. Peter, call, Paul calls him James, the Lord's brother. Twice. In the book of Galatians and also in 1 Corinthians. James, the Lord's brother. And the Bible makes it clear in Matthew and Mark that Mary had other children. James and Joseph and Judas and sisters beside. And it says Joseph did not have sexual relations with his wife until after she had brought forth her firstborn son. Mary is not a perpetual virgin. Okay? Contrary to the Roman system of worship. If his brothers were there when he fed the 5,000, how could you not believe if, if they saw that miracle? It just seems incredible that they didn't believe him after they saw what, what the Maybe they weren't is. there when he did it. I don't oh, know. Okay. I don't know. But they didn't believe. If, you know, how could Judas walk with him for three and a half years and turn his back on him? Okay. It was after he made his decision, it says Satan entered into him. At the Last Supper, when he made his final decision, he went out, Satan went in, entered into him. Not until then. Oh, did your mommy pinch you? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I was going to ask you about the G's again. I don't remember what I was going to ask you, though. Okay. <laughs> That's a, oh. <laughs> okay, anybody else here? All right. Now, you, I'm trying to teach you to look at what's there. What, what does it actually say? Then we apply it. Then we interpret it. But we see what is actually said. And so many people are twisting things. They read into it instead of reading out to it, out of it. It means what it means in that paragraph, in that sentence. It doesn't mean 45 things. It means one. Yeah. And we have to figure out what does it mean there. Yes, sir. So a couple of things. I still, this kind of embarrassing, but the, the living water, you know, I mean, the, the bread of life. And and hold the mic oh, up. Sorry, the bread of life and all this stuff, you know, I'm trying to figure out, is that about meditation? No, I mean, no, no, it's about relationship. About relationship. Relationship. Okay. But I mean, like, if I don't, you know, have to be doing other things throughout the day, I don't have my Bible right there with me, so I can't. You can munch. You know, huh? You can munch. That's why he changed the word. That's where I'm not following you. I'm thinking that's meditation. <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, and I mean, it's, it's easy to get pulled in to thinking that it, it, it's something other than what, what it's reading to right. be because of the ambiguity that's in the world. You know, they use that out there all day long. Right. You know, they... You know, they say one thing but mean another, and, you know, you got to yeah. try to figure out, you know. Yeah, but he doesn't say one thing and mean another. He means what he says, and he says what he means. I know. It's hard, it's hard to not bring that counterfeit into the, into it the is. reading of the Word. It is. It's hard to bring that into the Bible. It is hard. Alan? Yeah, the, like you say, the difference, of me, uh, the one word for eat is to sit down and have a meal. You can't do anything else. The other, you can munch on things when you're on your computer. You can munch on things when you're on your car. You're driving a car, you can munch on things when you're watching TV. It's just so you can munch and get fat spiritually. Amen. <laughs> okay. Jesus. You're reading things into it now. Yeah. <laughs> but that's what I had a brother Lawrence in the Middle Ages. I came up with a phrase based on this chapter, practicing the presence of God. Yes. Practicing the presence of God 24 hours a day. You need to talk to him like you talk to your best friend. You don't have to use big words. He's not impressed. He knows we don't know what they mean anyway. Okay? You don't have to approach him. We're family. How do you approach your family? How many of you are going to go home and say to your parents, Oh, thou most wonderful one? Or your wife. Or, well, you better say it to your wife. <laughs> I always tell my wife when I leave her, I love you forever. <laughs> and... Uh, you better do that, guys. Your wife wants you to tell her you love her. And all the ladies said? Amen. Amen. Don't be like the old Vermonter that said on their wedding day, I love you. If it ever changes, I'll let you know. <laughs> 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 hey. 
Okay, now, now let's look at uh, one more. Well, well, we got two more signs. Numbers uh, chapter 9. Oh boy, we got nine minutes. Chapter 9. Now this is a whole chapter, but uh, we're going to have to skip through it. Now here's the thing I talked about earlier. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from his birth. The disciples asked him, who did sin? This matter, his parents said he was born blind. That's not the issue. Don't ever make that the issue. Jesus answered, neither has this man sinned nor his parents. In other words, he's answering the question, neither one. Just read what it says. But that the works of God should be made manifest in him, I must work the works of him that sent me while it's day. The night's coming when no man can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had spoken, he spat on the ground, made clay with a spittle, anointed the eyes of the man with the clay, said, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is being interpreted sent. He went his way, therefore, washed and came seeing. Now, what are the facts that we see here? Just the facts. Pardon? Jesus is the light of the world. Okay, what, what else? Told him what to do. What else? What else? The man did it. What else? How was the man born? Blind. All right. Why was the man born blind? We don't know. To show the glory of God. <laughs> and no, he doesn't. Yeah, but that's not what he's talking about there. That's not, he's not talking about why this man was born blind. That's way over further, a whole different subject. You can't stick it in there. You can't read it from there over to here. <laughs> I must work the works of him that sent me while it's yet day. Verse 3. But in order that my, my works might be manifested in him. In verse 3, that, that's like the he, he, But is that the reason he was born blind, or neither does it go with the rest of the phrase? I think the punctuation there, you get some debates on that one. Okay. Yeah, you get... Remember, there was no punctuation in the original. And so, uh, most of the scholars uh, uh, now translate it this way, neither this man nor his parents, then period. But that the works of God should be manifested in him, I must work the works of him that sent me well at yet day. That is a strong but there. Yeah, it's, it's a strong but. It's Allah, isn't it? Yeah, strong but. So, uh, that's not why he was born blind, but I must work the works of him that sent me well at yet day. I, I notice here that... Um, that Jesus saw that he was blind, he wasn't actually begging or asking to be healed. Right, he wasn't asking to be healed, right. So God will, and what you can draw from this, God approached him with a miracle. He didn't ask Jesus for it. How many have ever had God do something for you you didn't even ask for? See, he does it all the time. He does it all the time. You stand back, wow, look what God did. Look what God did. And now, now other places, well, let's say three men that have been healed by Jesus met. They were all blind. Now, if you know the story of the Gospels, one would say, well, Jesus healed me. Here he anointed him. He took clay. Now, is there a possibility? You can think about this. It doesn't say so. Might be reading into it. What did God make man out of originally? The dust of the earth. Did he make eyes for a man born without them? We don't know. Did he take the same clay from which he'd made man? Don't know. Don't know. Okay? But it's a good question. <laughs> it's not answered. So if you say, this is what happened, you can't say that. You can say, maybe this is what happened. But you can't make a doctrine out of it. Okay? You can't, you can't for, let me, let me finish this first. Uh, Suppose the three blind men that have been healed. Well, he anointed my eyes with clay. Well, Jesus healed me, and he just healed me. No, no, it couldn't have been Jesus, because he, uh, he does it this way. He reaches in the clay, so it must have been someone else beside Jesus. See? Well, no, Jesus, I hollered out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. This is the man of, the, the man of Jericho. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. No, 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 that couldn't have been Jesus because he, he comes to you. You don't have to call him. 
You see, just because God works a certain way with you, he doesn't have to work the same way with him. God treats us all as individuals. All as individuals. He doesn't fit in a box. About the time we try to put God in our box, he'll show you he doesn't fit. And that's what systems of theology try to do. That's why I don't teach what's called systematic theology. I teach what's called biblical theology at master's level. I, won't, I refuse to teach that subject because they subjectize it and take every scripture out of context. But because God does it this way this time, he doesn't have to do it the same way next time. I know people that have been saved driving their cars. My roommate was baptized to the Holy Spirit under enemy fire in Korea. Pinned with his face in the mud. Well, I, no, I can't be the Holy Spirit because he did it to me in church. Can't be. You can't be God because it didn't happen the way it happened to me. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, at the end of John, uh, it says that all the miracles that Jesus had done, the, world, the books of the world could not hold. Right, that's what he says at the end. Yeah. At the end. And, and what I was thinking about. Like Hold the mic close, can't hear When you. I'm on the road traveling and I turn the corner, I say, I wish it was right there too. I wish I was there already. You know what I mean? Right. And that's what I was meaning by they were on the water, okay. and immediately when Jesus got on the boat, they were You got to hold the mic close. You keep taking it away. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I was talking about. When the, on the water, when, they, when Jesus walked to the boat, got in the boat, they were immediately at the land. Hold the mic close. <laughs> I can't hear you when you pull it away. I'm going to give that Okay, we got three minutes. Elizabeth's got something here, and then we're going to have to quit, because I, I promised to be out by 8.30 on school nights. <laughs> okay, keep reading, John. Reading, John. Okay. okay. And look at the I am's now this week, and then the week after, we'll start on the book of Ephesians, the Lord willing. Elizabeth? Um, I've always just thought about this scripture there in 9.4, uh, four, where Jesus is, remember, this guy's blind, and he's talking about, night and day and he's talking about I'm the light of the world and I'm like this guy is blind and the Lord's speaking words like I am the light I'm the, the light world. of the world and then one of the I am's I'm the light of the world and so what did he do this is the miracle that explains the word picture he enables a man to see now look at all the other I am's this week father we're thankful again tonight for your love and your grace thankful that we serve a God that's the same yesterday today and forever and as your son said, my father works hitherto and I work. He was still God. He was always God the son. He never stopped being God when he became man. 100% God, 100% man. So he used his power only as you directed him. And Father, we need that same kind of direction in our lives. We have the power of your Holy Spirit within. And help us to be available to use your power through us in ways that are pleasing to you. We live in a world that needs Jesus Christ. We live in a city where people need Jesus Christ. And we have as much responsibility in the Great Commission, each one of us, to be witnesses and to reach others with the good news of Jesus. I pray you'll anoint my brothers and sisters between now and the Lord's Day to invite someone that needs to be saved to come to the house of God that they might meet Jesus Christ as Savior. Help your people to give their personal testimony to other people as they realize if God did that for you, God can do the same thing for me. So I pray that you'll use your people, the power that's resident within us, the power of your Holy Spirit. I wonder as every head is bowed and every eye closed, do you know Jesus? I'm not asking if you want to join this church, we're not the way to heaven. But Jesus is the only way. The Bible says as many as receive him, he gives power to become the children of God. The Bible says he that has the Son has life, and he that doesn't have the Son does not have life. And if Jesus Christ is living in your life, you know it. It's not something you hope so or guess so. The Bible says we know we've passed from death unto life because he's given us of his spirit. How many can honestly raise your hand and say, Pastor Westlake, I know I'm saved. Jesus Christ is living in my heart right now. Just put your hand up and down. Now, maybe you couldn't raise your hand. And again, I'm not asking you to join this church. But how many be honest enough to say, Pastor, I'm not sure I'm saved. I need Jesus Christ in my life. Pray for me. Just slip your hand up and down. Anyone at all? Always give opportunity. Anyone at all, you need Jesus. All right, Randy and Elizabeth, would you help me in case someone wants to come up after we leave? And if you need someone to pray with you tonight, Randy and Elizabeth will be up here. And again, they're leaving for prison ministry again this week, as I already pointed out when we prayed. 
and just pray that God will use them and anoint them. And if you need someone to pray for you tonight, they'll be up here. They have a powerful ministry. Father, we're thankful for your grace. Use us for your glory. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. amen. Let's give the Lord a big hand for the Read John this week. Do your homework. Two more weeks on John, then the book of Ephesians.